Hello and welcome back to a nuclear craft video. It's been so long. I'm so sorry. I've just been very busy, um, but we're here today. Um, I've got a list of like five videos I want to do, um, but we're starting today with uh, fusion. It's been a long time since I did a fusion tutorial. Um, I want to sort of do it a little bit more slick, and obviously there's been some new stuff, um, including active cooling. I don't even think comparator control was in the last time I did a spotlight on fusion, and we've also got open computer support as well for those who um, like that sort of stuff. Um, so we'll get to all of that, uh, but first of all we've actually got to build our reactor. Um, so I've built one over there, and I've got a sort of cool recording of it being built. Um, but as you can see, uh, we basically just need three things. Uh, actually, we need four things. We need the fusion core. Um, the fusion core is here. It's this sort of big 3x3 three three block thing that you place down. And then around it, you need your fusion connectors, fusion electromagnets, and if you want, there's some transparent versions of those electromagnets. Um, so let's come over here and um, watch the recording, and then get on with it. So, there are two basic parts to building a fusion reactor. First of all, you've got the four sets of fusion connectors. In this case, I'm building a toroid size 4, and so I'm using three fusion connectors there. They're coming out of those uh, sides on the fusion core. Then you've got to start building the actual toroid ring. Now, I'm using a combination of clear and non-clear electromagnets, but basically what you've got to do is you've got to build a hollow square ring. As you can see, you need to complete the corners as well. Ring of electromagnets, and that's basically the whole build. Ready to go. So there are three things we basically need to get this reactor started. Uh, we need to power the electromagnets because that's where the plasma is going to be held. Uh, we need to power the fusion core to get it heated up, ready to um, ignite the fusion fuel. And we also need the fuel itself, uh, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, we also need some other things like cooling and a comparator setup maybe, uh, but we'll get to that later when we actually um, have the reactor turned on. Um, so, first of all, uh, I recommend getting enough power in your base or whatever to be able to power all of these electromagnets. Now, each of these electromagnets um, take 200 RF per tick to stay active. And here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 times roughly 16, so that's about 1800, 1900, no, 180 to 190 um, electromagnets, which translates to about 36,000 RF per tick. So 36 RF per tick, 36,000 RF per tick just to get the electromagnets online, um, which is quite a lot. That's that's already quite a few, quite a few uh, energy sources just to get the electromagnets online. Uh, but I promise you, once you get it going, it'll be worth it. Um, so you can power these um, using basically RF or EU. Um, I'm just going to use these uh, immersive capacitors because they're really good. Um, and once you power one electromagnet, um, power will try to spread. Um, to other adjacent electromagnets, although you will probably need to have a few sources. Um, the best way to do it, I think, is to um, have uh, one set of electromagnets powered here, just like this, and then the other set on the other side powered, so like this. So now I have all four sides of the plasma being powered. Um, and I can also power up this side as well. I'll just make sure that all of them are powered by just placing them right down. And slowly but surely they'll all get activated and now they're all green. So now our fusion reactor is basically sort of online. Um, so next thing we need to do is we need to uh, get this uh, powered up. Um, again, that's pretty easy. We can just sort of put a capacitor next to it. Um, I'll do that in a second actually. Uh, first of all, uh, we'll talk about how to fuel this thing. So if you go into the GUI with JAI, you'll see that there's a show recipes tab all across here. Um, and We'll get into what all these numbers mean once the reactor is actually on. But you can see there's loads of different recipes. Um, basically, there are a bunch of fusion fuels, and you can use any combination of them to uh, power your fusion reactor. So the fuels we have available are hydrogen, deuterium, tritium, helium-3, lithium-6, lithium-7, and boron-11. And then all the rest of the recipes are just different combinations. As you can see, um, quite importantly, when you react these... Um, gases or whatever together, these liquids together, um, you can see that we actually get some outputs from the fusion. So if you think about hydrogen, what hydrogen really is, is like two protons, two proton nuclei, and when they fuse together you're going to get deuterium. Uh, that's sort of what happens in the sun. And uh, that's sort of the same idea here. Hydrogen plus deuterium, those fuse together to make helium-3, etc, etc, etc. And sometimes you'll get neutron fluid, and neutron fluid is useful because you can use it to uh, get tritium. So you can irradiate lithium or boron uh, isotopes and get tritium out of it. And tritium is a very, very good fuel with deuterium, as you uh, may well know. 
Uh, if you have mechanism installed, um, you'll be able to get deuterium from heavy water, um, but otherwise you'll want to get hydrogen, and the way to get hydrogen, if you look at the recipe here, uh, unfortunately the advanced rocket, well, actually no, we can just look at the nuclear craft one, where's the nuclear craft hydrogen? It seems to be a different colour, it must be because I have mechanism installed or something. Um, you can see here that uh, water gets turned into hydrogen in the electrolyzer. And you also get a bit of deuterium, um, so the idea here may be um, oxygen obviously used to oxidize your fission fuels and do other sorts of stuff. Hydrogen can be used in a load of different chemical recipes, but mainly for the fusion reactor. And then you can also have a small uh, fusion reactor, so you can have a big hydrogen reactor and then one that uses deuterium or something. Uh, I don't know, if that deuterium is just there, you can do whatever you want with it. So that's the basic idea. Um, so I'm going to use, for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm just going to use hydrogen fuel. Um, so what I'm going to do here is probably get some, uh, some tanks, some portable tanks, just put them on the top. Um, now I'm going to show off one of the buttons here. Um, so there's four buttons down the side. Um, this prevent input overflow, uh, if it is enabled, then it will stop any of the same type of fuel filling the next tank. So for example, if I want to use a uh, hydrogen fuel, so let's get some hydrogen, and I put this hydrogen fuel in, you can see that because I have this button activated, the hydrogen is not flowing into the next tank. And that's obviously very useful if you're using two different types of fuel. Um, however, if I uh, unclick this button, then the hydrogen will fill the next tank. Uh, so that's basically what this button down here is used for. Um, these, this button here, uh, void leftover fluid, this basically means if the uh, reactor turns off, if it like doesn't have enough fuel to continue uh, fusing, then it will just clear out both of the tanks. So say if you're, um, you're using, like say, hydrogen and deuterium, and you're running low on deuterium for some reason, um, then it will clear out the hydrogen as well once it doesn't have enough deuterium. Um, this was requested by someone a while back, I think probably because they were trying to use one fusion reactor for different fuel combos. So that is sometimes something you might want to use. Void output overflow basically means that if these outputs get full, um, then usually if this is not clicked, then uh, the reactor will stop and say the outputs are full, you need to clear them out and use them somehow. Um, if this button is clicked though, then it won't matter. Um, it will just keep running and voiding the excess outputs. I'm going to have that clicked um, because I want to basically just keep this reactor around. I don't have to worry about the outputs. Um, and then finally down here, an efficiency or heat comparator setting. Um, if it's set to this by default, this blue uh, bar is the efficiency comparator. Most of the time you're going to want that. Um, but occasionally you may want to wait until um, the uh, heat in the fusion reactor is at a certain level. The reason you might want to do that will become clear later. Um, so you might use a cheap fuel to get the temperature up to a certain level and then have a comparator uh, sort of keep the um, heat level around there. Most of the time you're going to want it in efficiency mode. So most of these buttons are very sort of specialized except for this one probably, um, but they are going to be used in certain cases when you want certain setups. Okay, so now that we have got the fuel sorted, um, we need to now give the core some power. Now, the way this works is that we need to get the core up to a temperature of 8,000 kilokelvin. That's the ignition temperature for all fuel combos. Um, the ignition temperature is always 8,000. Once you get there, the reaction will start and you'll start generating power and the temperature will start to rise on its own. Um, now, the way you actually get uh, the temperature up is by just feeding power into it. Now, usually this requires a huge amount of power, a huge amount of energy, um, but I've got this creative capacitor here, so it should happen pretty fast. And by the way, notice that if I don't get there um, and I run out of energy or something, then the temperature will start to go down again. So you want to make sure you do it in one big burst and get there to 8,000 Kelvin, kilokelvin as, as efficient as possible. So now we get there and the reaction will turn on. And you'll start getting some sound effects. Now, for the purpose of this video, I am going to turn these down um, because I don't want to have to keep talking over the top of them all the time. But I'll have them slightly on. You can hear them in the background. Um, so that basically tells you that the reaction is happening. So you can see that the temperature is starting to rise on its own and some deuterium is starting to be generated according to this recipe. Um, and there we go, our reaction started. Now, we're not generating any power yet because the um, efficiency is incredibly low. Now, as this temperature starts to rise, um, the efficiency will start to rise as well. And there's a sort of equation um, that determines how the efficiency depends on the heat. And it's different for every fuel combo. So some fuel combos will uh, have a very high efficiency at low temperatures. Some of them will have a high efficiency at very high temperatures. For hydrogen, it's sort of in the middle. Um, but when I say middle, what I really mean is that the efficiency will be very high um, at a temperature probably around here, I'm just guessing. Um, something like deuterium tritium will have a high efficiency at a very, very low temperature. Um, it's one of the best um, fuel combos around, uh, IRL as well. The heavier fuels like 
boron and lithium, when they're fused together, they'll have a very high temperature for maximum efficiency. So they're different for different fuels, and um, really it doesn't technically matter in the end exactly where they are, but just know that to get to maximum efficiency with some of the fuels, it's going to take longer than others. Um, so you can see the, the temperature bar is starting to go up. We're still at zero efficiency, but the power is starting to go up. So we're starting to generate 20 RF per tick, um, and this will slowly go up as the efficiency slowly rises, and um, we'll maybe wait a bit and uh, wait for that efficiency to grow a little bit. By the way, I should mention, if you want to learn what the, uh, the temperatures are, the good temperatures, um, for the different fuel combos. Um, if you head over to the FTB wiki, there's a page there um, dedicated to uh, fusion fuels and their stats. And there's a little bit of simple maths that you can do with some of the stats of the combos to work out what temperature um, they're best at. Uh, there's also a fusion fuel calculator done by Viral, um, who's a streamer. Um, and if you head into the Nuclear Craft Discord, um, there is a link to that calculator as well. I'll also put it in the, in the description of this video. Now, of course, I should say, if you do um, want to extract the outputs of the reactor, um, which you most of the time will want to, because these are extremely useful, especially um, some of the new fusion fuels that you can then use in a subsequent fusion reactor, usually you want to set up a chain of these, um, because usually, starting with hydrogen, you then get your deuterium fuels, you can move them onto other reactions. Um, all you do is you literally do exactly what you might expect. Um, you get some sort of uh, conduit and you can just pump out the uh, fuel. If we just get this into uh, extract mode, you can see that you can just... Oh, hang on, I need to turn this into insert mode. No extract, and you can see this thing is filling up with deuterium. It's quite hard to see, but I promise you... Actually, I might be able to get it into my inventory. Um, you can see here that it is holding deuterium. So you literally just pump it out as you might expect. and. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just as simple as any other machine, really. Um, it's just a big sort of 3x3 three three version, that's all. Um, now, the efficiency has taken a while because of this particular fuel type. You can see now we are starting to generate a lot more power. Um, I will wait a bit longer, uh, but uh, for now, uh, I think we're good to start moving on uh, into the next stuff. Uh, so, the first thing to notice is that I have a lever down here. If I activate a redstone signal along the base of this fusion reactor, uh, it's important that it should be along the base. Uh, a redstone signal um, up here will not do anything. Doesn't turn the reactor off, doesn't do anything. Uh, but if, if you have a signal down here along the base, you'll turn the reactor off and all the plasma will disappear. And the temperature actually starts to decrease as well. So just be wary of that. If you turn it off for too long, it will turn too cold to even turn on again. Um, obviously, to turn back on, you just flip the lever. Um, so that's one way of turning a reactor on and off, just manually. Another way of doing it is using a comparator setup. This is probably the simplest way of automating um, the efficiency control of a fusion reactor. If you set a comparator along the base of the fusion core, then it will emit a signal that is uh, roughly proportional to its efficiency. Um, it will emit a full signal at 90% efficiency by default, but you can change that. Then all I need is a bit of redstone. And I need to just do a loop of 15 long, because that's obviously how strong the resonance signal is. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And so that means that when the fusion reactor gets into that very high efficiency range, then this redstone signal will be strong enough to turn the reactor off. That means that the reactor will cool down a bit until it goes below that efficiency threshold, and then it will turn on again. So it basically regulates the efficiency of the reactor. It will stick around that 90% level. Now, 90% is good, uh, but there is a better way of uh, regulating the efficiency, and that is to use active cooling. Okay, so we're nearly at that 90% mark. We're at 89% efficiency. Um, the temperature is slowly rising. Um, you will notice, by the way, as the efficiency increases, the rate of change of temperature will go down. Um, that's just a small thing. But as you can see here, the redstone signal is at strength 14 at the moment. We go and look over here. Strength 14, and soon enough, this last bit of redstone will activate and turn off the reactor briefly and sending the efficiency back down again. So, uh, by the way, also, the f better the efficiency, the faster this little thing in the middle rotates. I don't know why I added that. I think I just had the opportunity to, <laughs> and so I added it. Um, I've got to just wait around now. This last little... I'll try and get it in the corner of the GUI. Oh, there we go. It happened. Did you just see it happen? There, briefly. And you can see there the efficiency went back down to 89. So now we're at that stage where it's happening. So that's basically how the um, the efficiency regulation goes for the comparator setup. Um, once in a while this little bit of redstone will turn on 
and keep the efficiency around that. 89 just happened again there. We just saw it, it went down again to 278 megakelvin. So basically all this does is we'll keep the efficiency around this 90-89% level. Okay, so that's the most basic form of efficiency regulation. I'm going to cut this wire now and we're going to introduce active cooling. So active cooling is um, the way of making sure that your reactor stays at basically 100%. Um, now if we look at this temperature change here at the moment, there we see the temperature change in the temperature. We don't see anything about cooling, but as soon as I add an active cooler, um, I'll give it a little bit of water. Ooh, that doesn't quite work as I expected it to. Um, hang on, let me just um, get some water in there by doing this. Ooh, crescent hammer again. Crescent hammer, boom. Let's get some water in there. You'll see as soon as I do a little bit of coo active cooling with these active fluid coolers, I get an a active cooling rate little tab down there that tells me how much active cooling I do. Now, the amount of active cooling you need to do for every reactor, every fusion reactor, is always 5,000 Kelvin per tick. If you hit 5,000 Kelvin per tick, you will get a 100% uh, efficiency reactor. That is guaranteed. Um, any less than that, then your reactor will go over the efficiency curve and will heat up too quickly. And any more than that, then your reactor will still be stable, but it will just be stable at a lower efficiency. And the reason that is, of course, is because as the temperature, uh, as the efficiency increases, the temperature change goes up. Um, oh, sorry, goes down. So the, the higher the efficiency, the slower the temperature change. That means that if you have more active cooling, then the temperature change it matches is higher, which means the efficiency that it will stabilize at must be then lower. So 5,000 is perfect. Any more is still fine, but it will just be a bit lower than 100% efficiency. Any less than um, 5,000 Kelvin per tick, then you're going to uh, get too hot and your re reactor will eventually um, hit the maximum temperature and at that point it will melt down. It will basically turn to lava because it's just too hot. Um, so what we need to do is, as you can see here, just get a load of these active coolers and these active coolers will, each of them, uh, d uh, give a certain amount of active cooling to the fusion reactor. Now you can actually see how much uh, active cooling is done by heading into the fusion configs and here it will give you the active cooling rates. So the actual uh, materials are the same as the fission um, active cooling and also the basically the fission passive cooling as well. The only difference to be careful of is that um, this is actually wrong here. It says enderium. You can see on the third line it says enderium. That's actually a molten ender, so resonant ender. Um, it can't be enderium the metal. It has to be the just the pure ender pearl stuff. Um, so that is wrong. I need to change that. Um, but you can see here that the value for water, which we're using, is 400. So the value there is 400. And as you can see, if we look inside here, we have 50 Kelvin per tick being cooled. Now, why is it 50 and not 400? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, if we look in the configs, this is a, a major source of confusion, both with the fission and fusion active cooling. This cooling rate here is um, per tick per millibucket. Okay, but active coolers do not work at one tick, uh, one millibucket per tick. They actually work at half a millibucket per tick. Um, and the, uh, I think the setting for that is in here. Yes, maximum active cooler fluid rate. And this sets the maximum rate in millibuckets per second. So this is 10 millibuckets per second. There are 20 ticks in a second. So this is half a millibucket per tick. So half a millibucket per tick means that if we head back into here, what we really want to do is we want to halve this value. So that's 200 millibuckets per tick. Uh, sorry, 200 heat per tick. Okay. So base heat removed per tick is then half of this, so 200. But because this is a size 4 reactor, this is a size 4 fusion reactor, this result is then divided by 4, and that's where we get the 50 from. So the bigger your reactor, the more coolers you need. Uh, and so you first of all take the uh, base heat removal per tick per millibucket, you then multiply that by the uh, millibuckets per tick rate, which by default is half, okay? And then you divide by the toroid size of the reactor. And that gives you the active cooling rate for your cooler. Um, of course, if you get two coolers, let's just set another one up. You get two of them, as expected, we're going to get twice the cooling rate. So that's now 100 Kelvin per tick. And as you can see here on the side, it says 2%. That's the percentage of the p current cooling rate um, as a percentage of uh, the 5,000 Kelvin per tick that you want to aim for. Now, there is one more thing you need to know about active cooling. Um, you can actually increase the efficiency of these active coolers um, by placing them in special positions. So, for example, I have this active cooler here. It's a water active cooler, so it does 50 Kelvin per tick. 
and it's one off the center, if you know what I mean. It's one off the where the fusion connectors are, to the right, and it's also on the outside and on the top. Now, if I was to mirror the position of this active cooler with respect to the center of the core, then I need to go one to the right over on this side, and I also need to go down, because it's respect with respect to the center of the core, I actually have a line that's going through the block below, and so that line then carries through to here. So this cooler is exactly opposite the position of that one over there. If I'm then to fill this active cooler up with some water, I'm going to have to use a pipe here, let's fill this up, extract, then if we go and have a look in the fusion core now, you can see that I get an active cooling rate of 400 Kelvin per tick, not the 100 that you might have been expecting. And the reason for that is, if coolers are placed in this configuration where there's one opposite the other, then both of them will be quadruple the efficiency. So both of them will work four times as well. So the reason that we're getting 400 is because this one's working at a rate of 200, 50 times 4, and this one's working at a rate of 200, which is 50 times 4. So that's a total of 400. Now, of course, all I need to do now is I just need to do basically the same thing um, with a load of other coolers. Let's just um, let's put a load of them here. And you will notice there that all of the water just flew out. That's because these active coolers will actually share water if there's enough water around. So let's um, put a bunch of water coolers down. So I've got five here. And now I need to put five down over here. So that means that I'm going to need so uh, boom, boom, boom. Now that's not quite perfect, obviously, because I'm missing that one in the middle. Um, so that means that I'm now going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, quadruply efficient coolers. I'm going to also have one cooler that isn't quadruply efficient. So that's 50 um, times by eight times by four, which is 50 times 32, which is 1,600 and then an extra 50. So that should be 1,650, and it is. Okay, so that means that we're now cooling at roughly a third of the rate we need to be. Um, now, by the way, you don't have to use water, as I said before. You can use um, other uh, fuels, and they will, uh, other coolants, and they will work in exactly the same way. Um, if they're opposite each other, then they will be quadruply as efficient. Um, most of the time, you will only need water. Water is good enough. The other liquid coolants are much more powerful, um, and you do, I think, need them for large enough reactors. I don't think a size 4 is a good example for when you actually really need water, uh, don't you need to use something other than water, but if you have like a size 24, I think it's possible that you may need to use something better uh, than a uh, than just water, because eventually you'll just run out of space. Uh, I'm going to put a few more down here, uh, let's put some more, of course you can put them on the interior as well, but I'm just not going to, because it's just not as easy to see. Uh, let's get a few more coolers. I'm going to break this one actually, because um, I want to be able to count this a bit more easily. So that means I've now got 1,600. So this will take it up to, I'm going to count in, each one of them does 200 when they're quadrupled. So 1,800, um, but then it's double, we'll also do 2,000, 2,400, 2,800, 3,200, 3,600, 4,000, 4,400, 4,800. So now I need to just go and double this on the other side. So that goes all the way up to here. And I need to just get some water in there. Creative, boom. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Extract. Okay, that puts water into all those. Uh, that means I only need 200 more. And the easiest way of doing that is to just have four more active coolers on the inside here that aren't quadrupled. And I'll just get one more portable tank first. There we go. And that should now give me the full 5,000. Oh, it should give me the full 5,000 Kelvin per tick. There we go. And uh, that means now that my reactor will slowly it'll approach 100% efficiency and it will stay there. So basically, that is now a stable fusion reactor. Um, we've got enough active cooling um, to get up to that 5,000 level. And that's exactly what you want. Any more, then the efficiency will still be stable, but just a bit lower than 100%. So that pretty much is everything you need to know uh, about the way the fusion reactor works. Of course, there are details about um, how you're going to distribute these fuels. Um, are you going to just use one fusion reactor? Are you going to use a system of them? Um, so all the logistics I'll leave to you. I want to sort of leave that to the player to work out how to do that. A lot of players I see who play, especially Enigmatica 2, that seems to be a place where fusion reactors are used quite a lot. A lot of players just use mechanism deuterium, and that seems to do the trick. If you're not using mechanism, then of course you need to think about maybe this hydrogen reactor is not the only one you want to use. You might want to use the deuterium and stuff like that. Um, the logistics of that 
down to you. Um, but just know that there is some logistics to it if you want to completely squeeze everything out of your um, fusion fuels. Um, I'm going to head over here now um, to show off the last thing, which is um, open computers. So this is just a size 1 reactor. As you can see, there's actually no fusion connected at all. It's just straight up against the core, so it's a Toro size 1. Um, there's uh, a 5,000 Kelvin per tick rate here with active cooling. I completely forgot about the existence of these infinite water sources while I was mucking around with the um, portable tanks over there. Of course, these are in nuclear craft. You can just place these next to active coolers and it'll just spread water into them. So this is just a 100% uh, a, a stable uh, reactor build. As you can see, it's um, asymptotically approaching 100%. That's the word I wanted to use earlier. Um, it eventually will hit that once it sort of rounds up to 100%. So at the moment, it's probably at about 99.3 or 4 or something. Um, so what I've got here is I've got uh, an open computer setup. Now I actually don't know very much about open computers. I know that a lot of people um, can do these crazy things with open computers functions, but uh, the basics I know is that I've got these cables. Uh, these fusion core dummies that sort of make up the fusion core, uh, they're sort of like um, cables. They just act as cable and they all connect to the really important block which is the bottom base block of the core and that's sort of where everything is controlled. Um, so if you just connect cable to the dummies, it will just connect as you expect. And then you just need your uh, little setup here. I've just got a sort of tier 3 really powerful computer, um, EEPROM and all that stuff. And I've got my uh, display here. Now there are a load of functions that you can use. Um, now I, th you know, I'm actually just going to give it, I think if I just type in the uh, component, I actually get sort of a list of all the functions. Okay, so um, that's the address, which is like the sort of ID. Um, and you can see here there's a load of uh, functions here. Now I'll put it in the description, it's also on the GitHub page and in the Discord useful links. There's a list of all the different functions that you can do with a fusion uh, reactor. Uh, there's also um, a f open computer support for the fission reactor as well. I didn't actually add the open computers um, by the time that I'd done the fission tutorial. But basically um, it works pretty much in the same way. You just hook up the um, open computer setup to either a port or the uh, fission controller and there's a of, bunch of programs that you can use to read the structure and all that sort of stuff. Um, similar stuff here, you, there's a bunch of uh, little programs that you can use. The one that is sort of important that a lot of people will want to use quite a lot of um, is the activate and deactivate key. So this sort of works like the redstone signal in that you can turn on and off the reactor. So at the moment the reactor's on and if I just type in uh, deactivate, basically R is the component here, this, this, this is just a shorthand. And if I just click deactivate the reactor will turn off, as you can see, it's off. And I can just use deactivate, uh, sorry, activate to turn it back on again. There you go. So that's basically uh, what you can do, sort of, that's a sort of basic idea of what you might be able to do if you can read the efficiency and you want to wait for it to get to like 99 or 100 or something, you can deactivate it, wait for it to go back to 98, activate it again if you don't use active cooling, stuff like that. Um, of course, you can also do stuff like getting the efficiency, so R dot, um, get efficiency, I think is probably what it is. Get efficiency. Can I do like tab? Yes, I can. There we go. The efficiency is 99.348. Blah, 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 blah. So I was roughly correct, actually. Um, and there's loads of other different programs you can use and different functions that give you these numbers. And you can use them, obviously, in your um, open computers stuff. Um, and yeah, that's basically uh, open computer support in a nutshell. You can hook up a computer and use it to read stuff from the reactor. Um, I don't know what more there is to say about it. So that's pretty much everything um, to say about the way that the fusion reactor works. Uh, we've gone through how to get it started, how to build it, how to fuel it, how to get the products out, how to comparator um, control it, and how to actively cool it, and how to use open computers, basically. Um, don't think there's much more to say about how it works, so I'll end the video here. If you have any questions, uh, do of course go into the comments and, uh, and ask them. I'll be happy to, to answer. Um, there are a few bugs with the Fusion Reactor, very, very minor ones, it's to do with updating really. Um, sometimes on a server, it, sh it seems to be alright in sort of single player, but on the server sometimes when you turn on the reactor, the sounds won't play properly, and uh, this won't go white, the text won't go white, it'll stay yellow. Minor thing, the reactor still is working, it's just not updating the player correctly, I just need to fix that, it's a small thing. Um, actually, I don't know any other problems with the Fusion Reactor at the moment. Um, so it's pretty stable. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next video I do.